Today's guest is Jabari Brisport, an educator and member of NYC DSA. Jabari is running for New York State Senate in District 25. Earlier this year, he won the Democratic Party primary for the seat, and he has been endorsed by people like Bernie Sanders and AOC. Jabari is going to talk to us about how Democratic Socialists can run successful electoral campaigns. So um, welcome, uh, Jabari, to the podcast, and thanks again for, thanks for being here. Thanks, Kevin. So could you like just, well, first, let me ask you a question. How are you feeling right now uh, in the midst of things? We have an election that's happening very soon. You are kind of on the ballot um, and other people are too. So I, I guess I wanted to start off by just checking in with you and seeing what do you make of all of this? And then after that, we can jump into your, your journey with electoral politics. Oh man. Kevin, this is all just so exhausting. Uh, I think that's just been like the feel for the past four years <laughs> is that this is just exhausting. There are just so many fronts to fight on. And it seems like our enemies and our opposition are not slowing down. And, it, and it's, it's, a lot, it's a lot to keep track of. Um, but I'm always optimistic. Like I wouldn't be in the struggle and organizing if I wasn't optimistic, but it is a lot. And I mean, we started off with October <laughs> with Trump getting COVID. Like, I mean, we're in for like a mad dash of the next 30 whatever days um, before this election. And uh, you know what? I'm here for it. Oh, no, that, that sounds good. So um, let's get to your role in the election. So um, we don't get a chance to, not too many democratic socialist politicians, um, and then there really aren't many who like have a good chance or pretty much lock in, um, lock in their campaigns or actually win their campaigns. And so we wanted to, yeah, we wanted to ask you to first, I guess, talk a little bit about your journey towards democratic socialism and DSA, and then you know, maybe give us some context for how you eventually decided, oh, I'm going to actually run for office. Yeah. So my path to socialism was driven a lot by Bernie's 2016 campaign. Looking into that, um, I, it's, I, I always laugh at how much I've grown politically in the past four years. I actually didn't know single payer was a thing. Like I thought it was something Bernie Sanders invented when I first heard about his campaign. I was like, my God, what a genius. Like, it's like Medicare, but for all, like, I love Medicare. Medicare is great. That's so, what a, what a genius, man. Um, and then getting like really pissed off seeing that so many countries like had done it. And we were just like, just like the weird outlier. It's like the metric system, like the weird outlier that's just refusing to do it. Um, so his 2016 campaign got me interested in um, socialism and um I think the summer after we lost, I went, I kind of like came out of the closet as a socialist, um, specifically thinking about like the ties between socialism and racism and, sorry, oh, excuse me, excuse me, sorry, capitalism and racism. Um, sorry, I mentioned I was exhaustion earlier, right? So the ties between capitalism and Jabari, racism. this is a democratic socialism podcast. Oh my God. What no. are you doing? We You're gonna, canceled on Twitter. very liable now. <laughs> Gonna, gonna edit it out. Don't worry. We're gonna save our <laughs> save our politicians from uh, <laughs> from mistakes. So, are no, you fine? Um, <laughs> so I um started thinking about like slavery as an expression of capitalism and just how like how capitalism really fueled racism. I came into the closet as a socialist and actually joined another group, Socialist Alternative, first. Um, and I was with there for a few, uh, like about a month, a month or two. And, you know, I had a friend invite me to a DSA meeting while I was in Socialist Alternative. And I went to my first DSA meeting in like December of 2017. And the energy in the room was just electric and people were making working groups. And there was just, it was so much yes. And I, I come from an acting background and like improv and like people were, somebody was like raising hand being like, I want to start a group that focuses on energy. And people were like, yeah. And people went over with them. And somebody was like, I want to do a group that focuses on elections. And people were like, yeah. And they went over with them. And then um, I went, I went to join some housing people and they were like fighting against a really bad development, like in my, in like my neighborhood or an adjoining neighborhood. And 
I was just so excited by all the energy and the fact that they were doing stuff on the ground locally and ended up joining DSA. And um, yeah, uh, it's, 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 I have not looked back since. It's been my political home for the past three years now. Yeah, December 2017. Yeah, like, yeah, since I was part of the Trump bump. I too was part of the Trump bump, very, very relatable. Um, how did your DSA chapter help you with your campaign and, and what led you to, to decide to run? I'll talk about both campaigns because I ran twice and lost the first one and DSA was heavily involved with both. So I ran for, I ran a, um, I ran for city council as a Green Party candidate in 2017 with DSA support and we actually created an extra ballot line and so I ran as a green and also I ran as a we had a socialist ballot line that I ran on as well which did very well um, in the election and DSA was kind of instrumental you know we you know we launched our major field operation you know for the general election once the primary was over and DSA was the bulk of the um, field operation and helped with like comms and designing literature and and um, and also fundraising and helped me give me a boost early on. Um, and I would say this summer round when I ran for state senate as a Democrat, uh, the amount of involvement kind of exploded. Uh, this time, there really was no division between my campaign and DSA. You know, it was a fully DSA campaign, and um, we have all just grown so much as organizers and especially electoral organizers in the past two, two years or two, three years that, um, that it was uh, incredible the amount of work that DSA, the amount of connections we had in terms of communications and reporters and getting things out and making um, you know, media noise and also just our, our actual field strategy in terms of reaching out to voters and you know, constituents and also our connections to uh, nonprofits and labor unions, it had all just massively expanded in the, you know, three years. Oh, you know what, actually, I want to say I've been DSA for four years. I joined in December 2016 after Trump got elected. Yeah, so in the three, three, four years um, since I ran, just exploded. Could you talk about that growth uh, in your DSA chapter around electoral work from like late 2016, early 2017 uh, until, until now? Like what are some, I guess, examples of progress like what did y'all learn that made y'all more powerful when it came to your campaign your current campaign because it's because like you said it seemed like there's a lot of growth there so could you say a little bit about how it grew and what kind of steps and lessons y'all learned yeah a big um lesson we learned was that the field was incredibly incredibly powerful and just reaching out to voters one-on-one um, -on -one, uh and having conversations with them and that's what we honed as our skill and that's kind of what's made us an incredible powerhouse in New York, one of the biggest lessons regarding voter contact during my race was like, start knocking early and start knocking often. So like, we, I, I wanna say one of the biggest differences between my losing campaign and my winning campaign was that for city council, we, we really didn't start a, a massive door knocking operation until seven weeks out from the election. And for this Senate up, um, campaign, we started reaching out to voters seven months before the election so we were out there in november it was cold but we were knocking on doors uh, and then uh, you know when COVID shut down, now we were making phone calls so just the, the sheer number of people we reached out to um order of magnitude you know we knocked on thirty-five thousand doors i think for my city council campaign and we had approached twenty-five thousand even when COVID hit and then we called 350 we made 350,000 phone calls um for this um, election. So we just, we grew a lot and we discovered too that, um, so there's that growth in terms of just understanding that, that lesson, but also we've learned that like elections are a really great way to train new leaders. And, you know, a lot of us accept that, you know, there's gonna be a lot of trust and involved because you're basically entrusting roles to people that have not done this before. You know, we, we don't hire consultants. Um, we do the jobs that consultant firms do. We make connections to labor unions and nonprofits. We create field strategy. We design literature and communications. We do it all and we just trust people to like kind of figure it out. And we, you know, we, it was very rocky our first year. We lost both of our city. We didn't lose just mine. We lost our other city council election and anyone come in like, oh, these losers, they, 
they couldn't even win two city council elections. And then next year we won um, Julia Salazar's race and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And then, you know, we took on Tiffany Caban, who was bas basically unknown. And then she almost won like a full borough wide DA. And then now, and then one year later in 2020, we swept five um, state legislature races. So just by continually like refining and refining and refining. Absolutely, I think it's really, you know, New York is clearly a real inspiration for us who are excited about socialist electoral organizing because we see some real wins. Um, it's also really hopeful for me to hear about the history behind it though too, right? This is something that y'all have to work at, figure out and continue to grow and get bigger. Something that like stood out to me as you were talking a little bit, it sounded like one part of your strategy too is building a broader coalition and a coalition outside of just the DSA, other nonprofits, um, maybe more progressive groups. And I'm just curious if you could give us a little insight into how that was a part of your campaign um, and what sort of guided you in that. Yeah, I would say in terms of the coalitions, uh, I, I think all chapters have this to some degree, but we have like issue based groups. We call them working groups. I think other chapters call them committees or what, you know, assemblies or, or whatever. But we have like issue based, issue based, based working groups, like a housing working group and a, um, an energy, you know, environmental working group or you know racial justice and so on and so forth and often these are the groups that will go into coalition so for example like the housing working group might be in coalition with um uh, you know tenants union various tenants unions or other other nonprofits that are working with housing and then when it you know we have candidates running that acts as a conduit to like meetings with these organizations potential endorsements and also just having those relationships built off to begin with we have a labor working group you know which helps us just just literally knowing who to email like the first time i ran for i didn't i don't even know who, like how do you how do you get endorsement from a labor union was I, I don't know who, who do i talk to do I, what is the labor union email you know <laughs> um versus you know this time we're running around knowing okay it's this person for you know the uft this person for nice this person for this person this one we have a, a depth of knowledge um that had come from building and building in coalition with these people and um you know it gets stronger you know we can even think of you know some people being pulled into our orbit um some some um groups now I and mean, it's never you know local politics is always like you know turf battles and terrain and this and that but like you know, we only strengthen and strengthen these every year. And that's, it's, it's been very good for feeding into our electoral. And then actually it's two way because then when we are, we win as you know, elected officials, then we get to go back and like build even further with these organizations. So now I can like, I can make it easier for other candidates to get labor um, endorsements just because of who I am now as a state Senator. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to, I wanted to ask you about the the struggle of uh, running for office, for lack of a better term. I mean, you know, electoral work is hard and you lose at some point. In fact, you lose repeatedly, um, in fact. But like, you managed to find a way to both keep going and yeah, I guess I wonder if you could speak to, I guess, what, how y'all, how, what lesson you took from that? Because I think that a lot of people, whenever like their favorite Democratic Socialist candidate or even just a really progressive candidate runs for office but then loses um, at any level, it's very demoralizing and there's a turn away from doing any kind of electoral work. So I'm, I'm curious how y'all, yeah, how y'all took the initial losses that you took and the seemingly insurmountable task of getting people into office where you where you were because i'm sure there was i'm sure it's it's been a fight i'm sure it wasn't just oh you come on in jabari and take you know uh, come on in new york city uh, democratic socialists come on in and take office i'm sure it was a fight tooth and nail so if you could speak to i guess what that was like and pushing through that and like what what got y'all through that Okay, so I guess what's funny is like, you know that like that 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 uh, what's that slogan? It's like first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, get you, and and so on. So so we were in the ignore you, laugh at you phase probably until like, <laughs> um, probably till probably till we won with uh Julia actually, um, because truthfully I think it was like the very first we had the two city council races in 2017 and the first one was Cotter Elliott team in a democratic primary and he got like 30, uh, excuse me, 3000 votes and then everyone, then we lost and he was second place, but he lost and everyone was like, God, 
oh, we thought we were going to win. It was, and that one really hurt because it was the first one we tried. If you lose the first one you try, it's like, it's also your first loss. And the first loss sucks. Um, and then we um, tried to, you know, try and go for my campaign. And we got 9,000 votes, but it was a general, so it was much bigger field. So we lost that one too. And it was like, oh my God, we lost both of these. Um, and then um, I guess with Julia, we like kind of doubled down with it. And we found, okay, we have a very clear, like bad incumbent that we can attack. And we um, were going in on that. And then like AOC kind of happens. Um, like people were agit pushing for her. And like, I was, I, I started pushing for her to get an endorsement and we got that and she started getting momentum. We got excited and then she won. And then it kind of like, um, what's the word? Like, uh, it's like slingshot or something. I, don't, I think, yeah, when you like, you know, you, get, you catch the momentum. Snowballed. Um, yeah, snowballed, yeah. And like all the momentum of AOC got swept up into Julia and we won. And, uh, and then we took up, we tried to get even bigger, bite a, bite a, bite a bigger, um, take a bite even more, you know, take a bigger piece. And with Tiffany Caban, we said we would expand this. We're not doing just one district. We'll do an entire borough. And like, it really sucked when we lost, <laughs> you know, even though it was a much bigger undertaking than we'd ever taken before. Or like losing sucks, especially with that one, because we lost by like, I think 50 votes in a, in a race for like 90,000 people voted. So that I think I think that hurts the most because then everyone starts going, damn, if I had just if I had just done one more, if I had just showed three more hours, yeah, or sorry, you might go off. Oh, I just donated another hundred dollars. Everyone just like, ah, the thing that I do, that one thing is the thing that would have swept the election. Um, so those really sting because the victory was so, so, so close. And that was really, that was, you know, really upsetting. But then we said, you know, F it, we're going to go even bigger. So then we tried this slate thing for state legislature. So, you know, I'm, I'm hoping we have a pattern of wins now. It, it really has been a weird pattern where it's like we, we lose in 2017, then we won in 2018, then we lost in 2019, and then 2020 was great. But we are endorsing a bunch of city council candidates for 2021. And, and hopefully, like, you know, we have this, this continued pattern of wins. Um, because, and I, I think it is helpful because a lot of people to know that we, we did start off just losing and like having, we, you know, we were in the first they ignore you and laugh at you phase for like, you know, the whole year. Like, like truthfully, like when I, when I lost my city council race, it wasn't even like a real race. Like, I mean, the, the general election, the incumbent was a Democrat. She did not campaign. Like the primary ended, she packed it up. She did not campaign and like still kicked my butt. I got 30%, I got 29% of the vote. So truthfully, um, you know, people were making a lot of noise on the left, but like the general wide establishment was not scared of us, you know. Um, but, you know, if you keep on pushing and you allow your, your organizers to grow and build leadership and train new leaders, like, you know, you can actually expand your capacity and your organizing skills really, really quickly. Like from one cycle to another, it can drastically expand. When you decided to run again for, for state senate, what um what kind of guided your platform and how you picked your main issues that you were going to focus on and what are those issues? Um, in terms of the platform specifics, I oh, oh, well, let me start with what the issues are. So I ran as um my top issues of housing, education, and climate. Um, in terms of what guided the specifics of those. I would say it was, there was, you know, DSA and like what we were fighting for and like our agenda and what our platform was. We now have a citywide agenda um, or like a chapter wide agenda for what we want to see politically. And so that was basically what, what fed into my platform and I think all the platforms for the, for the candidates. And in terms of shaping it, um, it was shaped a lot by my last campaign. Um, housing was a big priority on my last campaign, but uh, education was not. And I had actually heard a lot of education demands from people in the community, especially working class um, black people and, and you know, Afro-Caribbean people who wanted more money for education and, and specifically more funding for like after school programs because they are worried about gang violence and just, you know, lack of opportunities for, for youth. So funding education became a top priority and it also tied in well with me being a public school teacher, that that was um, a focus. And, um, you know, the environment is just so, I mean, it wasn't, a, a, it wasn't as much of an issue when I ran for city council because city council really has not much power over environment in New York City, um, but probably a lot of places. Like we really, you can like retrofit buildings, but you can't really like build new plants, like, like, like clean energy plants. But as a state senator, like then you can, you can really push for it. And that's like, it, it really is like an issue that affects pretty much everything else. So I, um, I elevate that as a top issue. So you are a public school teacher. 
how do you run for an election while you're doing that? I assume you're still working. I am still working. Yeah, it was it was a nightmare. I wouldn't recommend I wanted to I wanted to die. And I really I just there was so many days I was like, I gotta quit this. I can't I gotta quit this election. I can't do this. Um it, it was really rough. You know, I had a really solid team um, behind me, a really sturdy team that could handle a lot and who I could trust to like make very, you know, solid decisions without without checking in with me. Cause I was, there were times I would just be like not able to respond to something for a few hours. Cause I was busy like, you know, teaching it in class. Um, so having an extremely extensive operation that was bigger than the sum of its parts, it was bigger than any one person. Like, I think by the time we got to near the end of the campaign, we had exploded we, from like a core team of a few people to, you know, we had several dozen people that were like, you know, in some form of leadership regarding the field operation, um, you know, a, a huge just network of people that were focused on fundraising, uh, a, just a huge array of comms people just doing research and helping like, you know, write and proofread op-eds and stuff for the camp. It was a massive, it was like a just it, was, it wasn't just a project bar running. It was like, it was like 80 people <laughs> um, running. And then like even a wider thing of like over a thousand volunteers, just like straight up, just like tell out with phone calls and stuff. It was just a huge, huge operation. Um, but I can't imagine, well, one, I can't imagine for running for office without that behind me. And I, I definitely can't imagine running for office as like a working class, like person without that. Uh, it's just, it would just be impossible. Right. I wanted to ask... So it's important, it's important as you point out to have like that team behind you um, for you to actually be able to do all of that stuff. And you building the team, I assume that the people who were on your team for this current cycle were also at least some overlap between them and the people who were on your team from the very beginning or do you, was it was it a lot of new people or a lot of these people have been kind of built up their leadership from your first election to this one? It was a lot of new people, to be honest, just because like a factor of that being like DSA growing so much that a lot of them were involved in other things. Like, for example, there was one guy that was very involved in my campaign who lived in like, you know, Harlem, like upper and then, well, for those who know, Harlem is very far from, I'm sure people know, but Harlem is very far from Brooklyn. Um, in terms of New York, it's, <laughs> you like things to be close in New York. Harlem is like an hour, it takes an hour to get to like Brooklyn from Harlem. Anyway, he was focused on things in um, like Harlem and upstate, up, up, up um, upper Manhattan and, and the Bronx, the Sam Luis Lopez campaign. You know, my, my manager um, during my city council campaign was based in Queens and you know, Queens DSA exploded, especially after Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. So she was focused on Queens organizing too. So um, it was a much heavier, like, you know, Brooklyn organizer focus, but also a lot of DSA people and people that I had met in the interim between um, 2017 and, and 2020. So because we're so interested in, you know, organizing and our organizers in the DSA, how do you think your electoral work in your chapters helps strengthen the organization and strengthen the organizers in the org? It's a lot of works there. It's a lot of things. Um, our or our well, first of all, our organizers and our working groups have a lot more access now. Um, so if we're planning like you know legislative strategy, maybe you know two or three years ago, our our tactics and strategies were limited to like protests and rallies. Um, and now our and like phone calls and this, but now our tactics include you know, having Jabari call three other state senators because I'm also state senator and, you know, and that's part of one of our tactics now. So we are like learning how to reckon with what it means to have that kind of power and how it affects like what we want to do. Like if we, we want to pass the, you know, we want to fight for the New York Health Act, we now have, we now have two state senators who can help with votes, you know? So there's that, how about it helps and gives them access like that. And you know what that also means is that I can, we can also do check-ins, right? So I can, now we can I can do check-ins with like, I keep saying um, in environment because I'm doing a lot of stuff with our environmental group, but like, okay, so so-and-so was here on the bill, so-and-so was here, oh, what do you think this? And we can brainstorm, well, what should I say? Should I say this with them or should I say this? And let's like, let's pick that because um, maybe that can like move them, uh, which is something that hasn't been ha happened before. Um, but then also too, what we were t um, thinking of is like figuring out like how to like organize more inside these districts. Like, let's say I, I, I'm in the 25th State Senate District, um, in New York and then say, well, what if we have, you know, 
my office has a working uh, a housing working group, you know, the housing working group of the 25th State Senate District, and maybe there's just a bunch of uh, also a bunch of DSA members who live in the 25th uh, district that happen to be part of that. And then, you know, now we're expanding um, our reach to people that are brought into, you know, the organizing via the campaign um, or by my state Senate office and, um, you know, potentially get radicalized by DSA members who just, ha they just happen to be there at the meeting too, because um, they live there too. <laughs> um, so there, you know, there's that. Um, and then, you know, honestly, people, we've just discovered we've done, we've developed a great culture of um in in new york city dsa of just like letting people learn by doing and just like really kind of making like the path of least resistance for organizers to just start a project and see how that can get supported and it's led to people learning stuff on the fly really really quickly and, and growing as leaders very very quickly and that's something i think we're going to keep doing so one thing about this year's election that's different from other years election is that we're in a pandemic. Yes. And I would have thought that made that made campaigning a little different. Um, so could you say about say more about like how COVID-19 has affected your campaign and how y'all dealt with it? Yeah, no, I thought we were going to lose. When, like, you, if you saw me in mid-March, I would have been like, the campaign's over and done with. We're going to lose. The only reason the only reason DSA wins campaigns is because we can knock on a bajillion doors, and now we can't knock on doors, so we're going to lose. And then, um, that literally, I was like, okay, I should probably, I really was like, maybe I should just pack it up because there's no, there's no way. Um, and then we people were like, well, we'll let's just do phone making. I was like, it's not the same. You know, we're still going to lose. I mean, I was just, I didn't say this, but I was like thinking, so how's, we can't phone make, so it's not the same. Um, but we started doing it anyway, and then I, and then still, it was so sad. Like you know, our first phone banks would have like four people in them or five people on them. Um, and this is actually, and the reason it was sad is because when we were like doing our canvases, they were in a process of going, getting bigger and bigger and bigger to the point where like when we were in February, March, we were having canvases with like you know on average like twelve people, and by 12, 15 people might come up. Some of them had like 20, 30, and I was like, oh, this is amazing. And then you switch to a phone bank, and like there's like four people on it, and you're like. Damn it, <laughs> we're gonna lose. <laughs> um, uh, so what we did was start um, re-strategizing strategizing how to bring people back in. Because um, it was a bunch of reasons why. It, was, it wasn't just us adjusting as a campaign, it was all our volunteers adjusting. And like one weird thing I learned was that people can totally love knocking on somebody's door and then absolutely hate being on a telephone, which I, I, that was new to me. But it was a lot of people were like uncom uncomfortable with it just because it was literally a different skill. They were like, ah, I know how to, I know how to canvas. I don't knock on doors. I, I can't, can't be on the phone. <laughs> That's just, I, I don't want to do that. Um, so there was that. And then also just the, um, the incredible fear that permeated the air in New York in March, April, and just the sense of not knowing like, who I, I just still think I just, whew, I, I get a shudder down my spine just thinking of New York in April back when like we were the, the epicenter of America's <laughs> crisis and we had like ten times as many deaths as like you know the, like the other states and I was like oh my god how is this happening just here and anyway there was just, there was ambulances all the time it was like quiet because the whole city was shut down and you could just hear ambulances and in the in the quiet it was just just the sirens oh day in day out it was just terrible. Um, so there was that and just people felt lost and confused and like nobody wanted to volunteer for a campaign in the midst of all that like why would you it's like you think you're about you're about to die like everybody just people are dying around you um so that was so that was a struggle just reaching out to people and letting them know how important it was that we win this race because like we're seeing what happens when we don't have a government invested in protecting people and their basic human needs so like the best thing they could do was help um, win material gains for working class people. And that translated into fundraising too, because we stopped fundraising. I mean, I was like, I can't ask anybody for money. Now everyone lost their job. I'm, I'm an asshole if I ask people for money, <laughs> lost their job. Um, but like, I realized, you know, I, I, I kind of had to, like, if we don't win this race, then, you know, in the long term, somebody, somebody not so good wins. And that's, that's worse um, for the working class and for the movement. So like, we had to do a big thing of letting people know that this is a very positive thing that they're doing is helping out this campaign, whether they're donating or whether they're donating their money or donating their time, like they were helping doing something magical. And then what really started working was like when we started in the phone banking, um, I started encouraging people, letting them know that the people they're reaching out to probably haven't spoken to anybody. So this human connection they're giving is probably 
um, you know, helping people, but also maybe even saving lives. You know, if people like, you know, are fully so deeply depressed because they're like socially isolated and haven't had anybody talk to them in a day or days like this, that just, we framed our, um, phone banking around starting off with asking people how they were and if they helped needed help or resources or connections to anything and then going into issues. And I, I told my, the volunteers pretty much every day, like that you are connected, you are saving people right now. You're giving them human connection, but you're also helping connect them with resources and you're helping them participate in their political process at like the most important time to be part of your political process. So it was all of that. And then, um, you know, we kept just pushing, pushing, pushing. And then like, even media, it was like hard to get, you know, anything published about our policies because everything was just COVID. It was like, if you're not reporting on COVID, what are you doing? And so nobody wanted to hear about what we thought about housing or any or this or that or that. Um, so we kept pushing un until we were able to still, you know, make a crack in it. And we started talking, thinking about how our policies have been affected by COVID. Like we started doing a big part um, thing on incarceration. Like why are there so many people locked up? Especially when there's, you know, there it's like a, these prisons are just filthy and ready to you know, spread to disease, disease everywhere. We started talking about poverty and how that exacerbates it and like why we need a New York Health Act, a single payer system. And we started like really um, sharpening on that. And then um, in June, in terms of everything going down with uh, when the George Floyd, Floyd protests um, exploded, they came to a particular head in New York City because of there was a deadline around the city council budget um, vote. And so the city council was deciding on the budget, which whether whether or not we defund the police, that's, you know, the budget side, it was at the end of June. And the, the primary, the elections were also at the end of June. One was June 23rd, the vote's on June 23rd, the budget's on June, June 30th. Um, so there was massive, massive pressure around defunding and, and, you know, police reform. And so that also just like boosted all our campaigns. And also once the George Floyd protests like exploded, it, it became okay to go back outside again. And we took full advantage of that, you know, you know, was rally for rally for racial justice, but also rally rally for housing justice and environment. You know, the rallies began again, and it came at a time right before the elections, and we all rode that momentum. And then we all won. And I wish I could say it's always that easy, but <laughs> um, it's definitely a slog. I think it's so. I think it's so um, important making that connection. Um, you know to to how COVID-19 is just really exacerbating some of the natural evils that we're facing from capitalism. And it like really inspires me to hear how you used your, uh, your, your phone banking as like an opportunity for actual mutual aid and, you know, connection and building within your community. I think that's a really, a really cool tactic. I hope people will take that up. Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, I, I wanted to yes. say really quick, Maggie, like I remember I remember thinking, oh, we should invite Jabari to the podcast, but I was like, he's probably doing a lot right now. Like it was earlier in like June. Um, I was like, he's probably he's probably doing a lot. Maybe we should maybe we should contact him after his, <laughs> after the primary because um, seemed very. I mean, like every. I mean, I definitely you just described like being in the middle of it. So I you know to me could imagine I, I'm watching from the outside hmm. what's happening and it was like yeah pretty pretty awful what COVID was doing and every it's very I mean it's still uncertain but I think now people have gotten more of a sense of hey, it's uncle COVID you know it's <laughs> people have lived with it um a li little bit more even though we're still in this this big moment of political instability so i don't know I, hats off to you for yeah managing to actually yeah push through during yeah. that super tumultuous time and not get COVID as well um Very grateful uh, for that. so that's that's good yeah marcella got COVID. it was really scary oh really? oh wow yeah and Farah's husband were pretty sure had it and Farah has antibodies now so i guess you know <laughs> Yeah. So why, in your opinion, is it important for socialists to even run for office in the first place? Why should we be doing it? I like that question because like I think it's really important that in like a general strategy of winning over a socialist revolution, like you can't discount electoral politics. I mean, you can't discount a lot of things. I mean, I feel like it's going to be some mixture of strong electoral victories, um, really deep and radical labor organizing, and just like mass movements in the streets, some combination of those three. 
that will help bring about like, oh, finally we've like dismantled capitalism. But you definitely can't like discount the way that elected officials that are socialists make it easier, can just literally just open the door open for activists to get more access um, to what's going on. You know, I, I, I it, it's not even just about passing legislation. It's about the fact that defunding the NYPD is for one example, like, you know, when a bunch of activists are on the outside, just shouting defund the NYPD, defund the NYPD, it means one thing, but for example, in New York State, if State Senator Julia Salazar uh, is the first state senator to say, here's what we need to defund the NYPD and that what that looks like, there's a there's a whole other level of like legitimization that happens. And now if you have like two state senators <laughs> saying it, um, all of a sudden maybe, uh, you know, one, it's even more legitimate, but then also other other state senators might be like, well, if there's two states, maybe I can say it too. I mean, I, you know, they might be like, well, I would have been scared. I would have been scared to say it, but now if Julia and Jabari said it, they've already said it, so now I can say it too, you know? It, it, it allows others to be more radical around you too. So it shifts the conversation to the left and what's possible. Um, in, in the same way as just like Bernie Sanders, right? Bernie Sanders lost both his presidential elections, but you know, 20, between 2016 and, 20, and 2020, you know, 2016, it was like $15 an hour. Oh my God, Bernie, Bernie's so far to the left. You know, that'll never happen, right? Single payer, what he's talking about? And then all of a sudden everybody is just on the Bernie train and his policies in like the course of two, three, four years. Um, and you can do that at all levels of government. So it's like pushing the conversation, it's access, it's radicalizing other electeds who are, you know, would, would be more radical, but they're like scared because they feel alone, you know? Um, it's, it's all those things. And then, you know, it allows allows labor unions to be more militant. By, you can pass legislation to make it easier to, organ, to unionize. You can pass legislation to make it easier to organize. Um, so it's really critical. It's a critical piece of the puzzle. Yeah, I'm so glad you, you brought up the importance of losses too, and like something that I feel personally a little frustrated about in like the discourse now around um, like the Bernie Sanders campaigns is that yeah it's, it's deeply painful and frustrating that we didn't make it and it's crazy exciting and inspiring that we got so far um, mm -hmm. and have changed the conversation. I think it's pretty undeniable now. I mean the fact that people are you know, talking about Medicare for all like on the national stage all the time. So mm -hmm. yeah, thanks for that. And I also like how you um, talked about elections is, um, you know, another tool and toolkit, because I think sometimes people have, you know, try to parody people who do electoral work, where they're like, well, you think that if the only thing you do is elections, then you're gonna, no, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's, as you said, it just makes things easier. Um, it's not necessarily the one tactic, um, or the one thing that we can do to build toward democratic socialism. The last question I want to ask you was about this election, particularly there's, you may have seen um, that uh, there are a lot of reasons why this general election is gonna be different. Um, <laughs> and there are also reasons why it's going to be an organizing opportunity for um, democratic socialists, DSA chapters, or really anyone trying to push for kind of radical politics right now. And so I was wondering, did you have thoughts about what you or your chapter is doing around, um, is doing around this particular uh, election? Because there's a lot at stake and yeah, there are different things that can be done around it. So wondering how, how y'all were thinking about this election. We could use some advice. Yeah, please. Oh my God, I, you know, I wish I had some, you know, we, we are, we've, I, we, we've put so much energy into state politics that we are deeply focused on how to just make sure that New York is like safe and like how we're gonna focus on, you know, what the dynamics are in the state, obviously like, in a best case scenario, um, Biden wins and is movable on stuff. Like, you know, and then we can like pressure him for stuff, a Green New Deal and single parent, all, all this stuff, you know, and then like in a less good scenario, Biden is, and you know, and we would need to, you know, build, organize and organize around, you know, moving Biden and stuff, you know, in a less good scenario, Biden wins and is not so movable. And that's an organizing opportunity to, you know, agitate around the fact that he he won but he sucks which is <laughs> just so true um and then i guess in like your very 
Very, very, uh, you know, not so good scenario. You know, Trump, Trump wins, um, and then that's an organized thing because he'll be much more evil in with with like you know as a, as a lame duck president, um, which presents his own organizing opportunities and really like the really the fight for state power. I think and states' rights is be extremely strong under a Trump presidency. Um, and then I guess that you know just going even further into the darks, like there's the there's the possibility that, you know, uh, you know, Trump loses, but doesn't concede and like calls him the military. And then we have some, you know, a pseudo civil war or something. And like, what, what, or, I don't put it past him. So like what, what, you know, what that, what that involves. Um, but um, I'll be honest, I really, I really don't uh, have advice around how we're organizing you know, regarding the two ones. I do think we need to see, still keep building regardless. Um, you know, what we've seen in New York is our biggest um, um, registration membership growth happens around elections. Like we had the Trump bump, we had in New York, we had the AOC bump in New York, and we were seeing a ton of growth this year, um, and like a ton, ton, ton in the Central Brooklyn area. You know where where me and Farah just ran. Um, it's just like really exploding. Um, so a lot of it's just like continually to keep doing the work. And I don't know, it, you may want a flow chart for like how your work is different, um, depending on who, <laughs> on who wins. <laughs> we also had an AOC bump in North Carolina. So it's one of the amazing things about, uh, you know, when we have these like democratic socialists on the national stage at all, it's really mm -hmm. exciting uh, for chapters that are all over the, all over the country. Nice. Something that you were talking about, about this organizing Tito, eh, electoral organizing, I think, you know, like we're, we're focusing on New York, I think focusing on the local electoral politics side of things is really an important strategy here, though, for, um, you know, both, like, connecting members to how politics actually works in their communities and to figure out, like, how the power is mapped and what we can do, and also to, like, feel hopeful and engaged and encouraged and to actually, you know, do something, like, meaningful that we can accomplish. So thanks, Jabari, um, for coming on to the podcast. And we want to add, could you say any kind of your information or things you want to plug for the people um, before you head out? Uh, yeah. Um, Jackie Fielder is running an awesome state Senate campaign in Cali. Um, I've been supporting her. And um, also, you know, I'll probably be supporting some... Uh, some uh, of our comrades in, in Pennsylvania as well, um, in their generals, there's phone banking or something, just because it's a way to get people to vote Democrat without having to talk about the, <laughs> the uh, not Democratic nominee. <laughs> so, vote, Demo uh, vote Democrat without thinking about the Democratic nominee. That's like, <laughs> that should be our electoral strategy 2020. Um, <laughs> So yeah, look out for the comrades and you know, Nikhil Saval and all of them in, in um, Pennsylvania too. Thank you so much for taking your time and coming and talking to us, Jabari. Yeah, thanks Maggie, thanks Kevin. Yeah, and don't forget about, don't forget about me when you <laughs> ascend to the heights of politics. So just don't forget about the little people. Um, don't throw stones in glass houses, uh, new <laughs> member of the MPC. Oh, no one knows what the NPC is, <laughs> you know. People like, listen to this podcast no one, definitely. No, no one definitely knows the NPC. This, <laughs> even the people listening to this podcast, even if they know what it is, they don't know what they do. Um, so that's true. Yeah, it's like cl clearly, you know, New York State Senate a little. Yeah. So maybe gonna, slightly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so don't don't forget about me, uh, Jabari. <laughs> so you can forget about Maggie, but not me. So. <laughs> I think that's fair. So Second only one. <laughs> <laughs>